Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for bringing us together again. I want you to stand up and to pray and to give glory to God for the way he has started the year with us and for the way he's leading us through. What a wonderful God we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you very much for this day. You are a great God, a good God, a wonderful God. For your mercy, for your protection, all through the beginning of this year. Lord, we pray that you accept our praises in Jesus' name. We thank you very much for our brothers and sisters, our young people, these wonderful young people who are here today. Lord, we thank you for our children too. Thank you for the impact of these Bible studies in our lives, for the things you have done in the past, for what you started doing this year again, and what you are going to do for the rest of the year. We give the praises, the glory, the honor to you. Accept our praises in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you today. We bless your name for bringing us back to a series again. We pray, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding and you help us to be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Let your grace and your love abide on everyone. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We thank the Lord once again for this Bible study. Of course, you can see now. I thank you very much. We bless the name of the Lord for what he has done and for what he's still doing. We're coming back to a series scene, First Thessalonians, and I'm now looking at chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. Open your Bible with me. Verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15 now. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, proceed, or hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another, with these words that's a passage talking about the rapture now you understand that the rapture is the catching away of the saints when christ shall come he comes for his son he comes for the redeemed and then those redeemed righteous saved sanctified holy godly people of god they'll be taken away from this earth what a glorious day it will be and i pray that you'll be part of that in jesus name i'm sure you've sung the song before when the saints go marching in oh lord you'll count me as one of them you'll be one of us in jesus name now you'll notice something that uh, Paul the Apostle said in verse 13 at the very beginning he said but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren these were brethren these were born again they were children of God and yet the possibility of being ignorant was there as a pastor as a teacher and as a leader in the household of faith among the flock of God and the people of God he, want, he was very concerned for the church that the church would not be ignorant actually when you look at the position of the pastor and the purpose of the pastor and the ministry of the pastor and the message of the pastor the Lord tells us what the pastors are supposed to do and that's exactly why Paul the apostle said what he said look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 15 there jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 and i will give you pastors according to my according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding it's telling us here that when god gives us pastors according to his own heart leaders according to his own heart bishops and overseers according to his own heart there's something he wants done he wants those pastors and leaders and overseers to feed us to feed the church with the knowledge and understanding of the word of god that's why paul the apostle said you're supposed to be fed with knowledge 
And what's understanding? And because of that, I do not want any form of ignorance in you. Actually, Paul the Apostle used that word or that phrase not to be ignorant a number of times. Look at Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 13. You'll see what he's saying here. Not to be ignorant. And I say, we're starting this year, we're starting the knowledge of the word of God. And you will not be ignorant of that word in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. And here we we'll see from verse 13. Romans 1, open your Bible with me, verse 13. Now, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but I was hindered or led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even, um, even as among all the Gentiles. He was telling these people about his commitment to the preaching of the word. And he says, we should not be ignorant of the commitment of every leader, every overseer, every pastor, in fact, of every member of the church, to the commitment of the preaching, to the preaching of the word, of God. Another thing he doesn't want us to be ignorant of is that the things that are reaching, they are for our admonition. Look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would know that it should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the clouds. And then he says, and all pass through the sea. Come to verse 6. It says, now, these things are for our examples. To the intent, for the purpose, we should not lost utter evil things as others are they also lost it look at verse 11 it says now all these things happen unto them for examples and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come it's telling us that we must not be ignorant that all these things in the scriptures all the examples all the admonitions all the instructions everything we have there is for our learning and we should not be ignorant of that if we were ignorant of that we'll not apply the scriptures to ourselves we'll just read and say okay it happened to them that happened to those people we will not know that we are connected but paul the apostle is saying i don't want you to be ignorant that these things they concern you also they concern you they concern me and then about the gift of the spirit for the evangelization of the world we should not be ignorant and also we should not be ignorant of the necessity of telling people around us that jesus christ is lord and jesus is savior and jesus is coming back again i'm asking the question now what if you are ignorant What's the consequence of that? Well, does it really matter whether I know the word of God or not? Does it really matter whether I come to Bible study or not? Does it really matter whether I know the salient truth and the sacred truth and the central truth of the Bible? Does that really matter whether I know them or not? And let's see the consequence of being ignorant of the word of God, ignorant of the doctrines of the Bible, the consequence of being ignorant of the things we ought to know. So you will see the importance of knowing these things for yourself. Cells. We're looking at Osea chapter 4. Osea chapter 4, reading there from verse 6, it says, My people, they are the people of God. They claim to be born again. They claim to be saved. They claim that they love God. They fear God. And they accept the word of God as the word of God. But these, my people, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. You see, when we are ignorant of the word of God, of the truth of the word, of the inspiration of the word of God, and the fullness of the word of God, what that does for us is that we're destroyed. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because thou was rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. It brings rejection when we're ignorant of the word of God, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I also will forget thy children how serious then it is that any of us should neglect the word any of us should be ignorant of the word in fact it says if our souls are ignorant of the word empty of the word and if our souls are devoid or void of the word it is not a good thing in proverbs chapter 19 proverbs chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 2 proverbs 19 verse 2 also that the soul be without knowledge it is not good 
that the soul, why don't you say it directly, that your soul in particular, you say you're a child of God, you say you're becoming to the church, you say you're born again, and say praise the Lord, I belong to the Lord, I mean remember the church of the living God, and it says that you, your soul, be ignorant of the word of God, of knowledge, it is not good. Let's come back to First Thessalonians. We're reading now from chapter 4. And you see what the apostle is saying concerning this coming of the Lord and concerning the rapture, the catching away, the taking away of the saints of the people of God. And he's saying you must not be ignorant. Of, you must know this. Look at it now in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, we, that she sorrow not even as others that have no hope. When we do not know about the rapture, about what will happen when Christ comes, what he's going to do for us is that we'll be sorrowful. When we have lost a member of the family, when we have lost a member of the church, when somebody is dead, the sorrow will just multiply because we're ignorant of the purpose of God or the plan of God, of what God is going to do with that individual who is gone. Then it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. It's telling us that they have not, they have not been lost and they have not died in vain. That if we believe that this is what the Lord has, this is what the Lord has done for Jesus Christ, he rose from the dead. And that those who have also believed in him, they also will rise from the dead and we have not lost, they have not lost anything at all and will not be sorrowful. In fact, these uh, Philip, these um, eternal believers, they already knew that Jesus Christ was coming again. But their perplexity or their problem was that they didn't know whether those who have died, whether they will miss or all that the Lord has for us in the future, in the rapture of the saints. That's why we're looking at this today, the rapture of abiding saints in Christ. The rapture of abiding saints in Christ. We're going to look at the message today, the study today, as three perspectives. Number one, the resurrection of precious saints at Christ's coming. Number one, the resurrection, that is, those who have died. Those who have died before the rapture, their body will be, will be raised from the dead, and then their souls and their spirit will join them, and then they will now go up together with the people of God. The resurrection of precious saints at Christ's coming. Number two, the rapture of purified saints at Christ's coming. The saints who are saved, the saints who are born again, the saints who are purified, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. When that rapture takes place, the trumpet shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise up. And then we which are alive were going to be with them and they will rise with them. What a glorious in the rapture, purified saints at Christ's coming. Number three, the readiness. If God is going to raise up the people who have died, those who have died in Christ, and if God is going to also rapture or take away the purified saints, what should we do? What's your responsibility? What's my responsibility? What should we do? And what should I do so that I can be ready and you can be ready and we as a church, we can be ready. Readiness of persevering saints for Christ coming. Persevering saints. The storms will be there. The water may go under the bridge and it may be that there are temptations and trials and troubles and all the normal circumstances of life. But the point is that if you persevere and you endure unto the end, it is only then you know that you are ready when the Lord comes. Let's come back to number one. Number one. What's number one again? Tell me out loud. Thank you very much. The resurrection of precious saints at Christ's coming. We're coming to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. And you'll see here that the Lord is talking about resurrection. Resurrection. Those who have died. They died while they were seeing the faith. They didn't backslide. They didn't give up the faith. They didn't uh, die in an Habali's house. They didn't, when they were sick, maybe they were sick before they died. They didn't go to, you know, get to all these uh, witch doctors. They died in the Lord. They remained in the Lord until their last breath. And the Lord is saying for such precious saints of God, there's going to be resurrection at the coming of the Lord. I've read it how many times, and I'm going to read it again. It's, not, it's never too many. Look at it in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, brethren, 
children of God, people of God, don't be ignorant of this. Concerning them which are asleep, it's talking about those who have died. Whenever believers die, because it's just like since they're going to wake up and since they're still going to meet the Lord, it's like they just fell asleep. That's what the Bible says when uh, Stephen died. They say he just fell asleep. It says that she sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We're not like the other people. The people of the world, they cry and cry and cry and nobody is able to wipe their tears away. And even after many years of your beloved one that has gone, they're still sorrowful. You know why? Because they do not have any hope. But the Lord is telling us that we were children of God. Ours is different. We're not like others that have no hope. In verse 14, for if we believe, and thank God we believe. I said thank God we believe. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Praise the Lord. It tells us right there that, you know, the believers may die. You know, sometimes they, when they have finished their work, their assignment over here on earth, of course they may die. But their death is not something that, you know, is not known to God. In fact, it says in Psalm 116, Psalm 1, 1, 6. I'm reading from verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. If you look at the first word in that verse, it's precious. And the last word in that verse, saints. If you bring those two words together, precious saints. Precious saints. They are precious in the sight of the Lord. That's why it says we are talking about the resurrection of precious saints at Christ's coming. They were rise again. And anyone that, have died, that has died, a child of God, a real believer, he was serving the, he was born again. And as he was born again, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and living a righteous life by the grace of God. Because the grace that brought salvation had appeared unto him, or unto her. And because of that grace that brought salvation, and he was saved, soundly saved, genuinely saved. And then he died or she died. On the light, the final day, he will hear, she will hear the voice of the Son of man. That's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and she, he or she will rise from the dead. Give me a good amen. We're looking at John, John chapter two, five, chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. John chapter 5, verse 25. It tells us here, verily, verily I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. It says the time is coming and thank God that's the day the day of the rapture. The day when the voice of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ will talk from heaven, will shout from heaven and then that voice will raise the dead. Are you surprised about that? Do you remember the case of Lazarus? That Lazarus was dead already. Four days he's been in the grave. In fact Martha said that by that time, he was thinking already. And Jesus said, roll ye away the stone. And then Jesus just said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had not said Lazarus, if he said all the dead come forth, they will come forth. That was the power, the majesty, and the glory of the voice of the Son of the living God. And the Lord is telling us that the time is now coming. When Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, when he will utter that voice, that authoritative voice, like thunder, and he will say, come forth, and did they will all come forth. I'm reading that again, verse 25. John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily. I'm sure you understand. Every time you see those words in the New Testament, especially from the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, truly, truly, there's no shadow of doubt in this. This one is affirmed and unconfirmed and confirmed from heaven. Verily, verily, certainly, certainly, assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming. That's the hour of the rapture. And it says, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that here shall live. Then he tells us in verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority, has given him dominion, has given him power to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Verse 28, marvel not, don't be surprised at this, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the 
grave shall hear his voice. It says, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That's talking about the time of the rapture. They that have done good, they'll come to the resurrection of life. The world were ready to read that Jesus died and he rose again. And that even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's telling us something here. The basis of the believer's hope is the resurrection of Christ because Christ died and he rose again. Because of that, on the basis of that, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, all believers in him, all those who have had real confidence and trust in him, they too, they will rise from the dead just as surely as he died and rose again. So the dead in Christ will be raised and will take part in his coming. His resurrection then is a pledge. His resurrection is a guarantee. His resurrection is a proof of ours. The dead in Christ are now asleep in the Lord. Because that's what we're told here in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 14 all through to verse 16. But they will be raised from the dead at Christ's coming. It's important though to know that in the New Testament we say the believers fall asleep. They sleep, that means it's only the body that is lying down there in the grave that's referred to as falling asleep. Never the soul. The Bible does not teach that the soul sleeps at the time of death. The believer departs to be with the Lord at the time of death. I want to, I want to show that to you because there are some people that are convinced, confused about that and they feel that when a believer dies, he's resting, he's sleeping, his soul is sleeping, his spirit is sleeping, everything about him, about her is asleep. No, it's just the body. But the soul and the spirit, they are what they Lord. Immediately a believer dies, he goes to be with the Lord. Only the body that is buried here on earth, that's the one that is referred to as sleeping. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading there from verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. It's not very clear. The moment a believer dies, the spirit is absent from the body. And then that spirit immediately is present with the Lord. Do you remember the story that Jesus told you about Lazarus and the rich man? We're told that immediately Lazarus died. He was conscious in Abraham bosom. Immediately after death, he was conscious of the joy and the bliss and the glory and the peace and the pleasure in the very presence of God. On the other hand, the rich man was conscious too. Conscious of uh, the torment and the suffering uh, in hellfire. That's why he immediately was saying, I'm tormented in this flame. You understand then that immediately after somebody dies, he goes to the great beyond. That is, uh, the soul and the spirit, they go to the great beyond and if it's unbeliever, he suffers, begins the suffering right there. And if it's a believer, it begins the pleasure, the enjoyment, the paradise, and the goodness of the Lord, even from the beginning of that life eternal. And then you remember when Jesus was dying on the cross of Calvary, and that uh, thief on the cross said, remember me, when you come to your kingdom. Jesus said, let me read that to you, because uh, it is very important for you to know this, and for you to understand that this is the word of the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, I'm reading to you from verse 42 and verse 43. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What did Jesus say? Listen to the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ. The man was dying on the cross. And the Lord said, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Today. That is, immediately that fellow died, he went to paradise, he went to the bosom of Abraham, he went right to heaven. That tells us then, when a believer dies, the body sleeps, the body is buried, the body is taken from the cross and then buried in the grave, or the body is taken from wherever she died or he died, and then buried in the grave, but the soul, the spirit goes to the Lord immediately. Uh, let's look at this in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. This is the time when Stephen was dying. Just to let you understand beyond any shadow of doubt that it is the body that falls asleep. 
But the soul, the spirit goes to the Lord immediately. I'm reading from Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my, my watch. That's right. My spirit. That is, the Lord Jesus was going to receive his spirit right at that point. The spirit was not going to be buried with the body. Receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin, the sin, to their charge. And when he had thus said, he fell asleep. That means he died. That means his body died. And that's why Paul the Apostle said in Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1 is the body that goes to the grave. Is the body that sleeps. But the soul goes to the Lord. The spirit goes to the Lord immediately. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 21. For to me to live is Christ. But to die and to die is gain. He's saying while I'm living that I live for Christ. While I'm living, I'll do everything for Christ. I spend every moment, every minute, every treasure, every talent, everything I've got. I'm going to spend that for Christ. For me to live is Christ. But then he said, and to die is gain. Now, if he was to die, and then he will not get to heaven immediately, and then he'll just be like that, no presence of God. His soul will be sleeping, his spirit will be sleeping, and he will not see the Lord in another thousand years, or two thousand years, or three thousand years. When the rapture will take place, then what, what will that be? What will be gameful there? But it's because to die is game. Because I'll see my Lord immediately. That day took, takes place. Look at verse 23. For I am in a stretch between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. It says, when I die, this is my desire, to be with Christ immediately. And it says, that is far better. Let me come back to what we are talking about. We are talking about the resurrection. The resurrection of the dead. And that when the believer dies, now the body goes to the grave, his spirit goes to the Lord. But when that rapture will take place, and will hear the voice of the Son of Man, and the Son of God, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, a Savior, a Redeemer, a King, our Lord, that at at that time, the dead in Christ shall rise, and then those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them. Let's look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 23. The resurrection of the precious saints at the coming of Christ. John 11, verse 23. Here it says, but I know that even now, whatsoever, that's verse 22, thou shalt, thou will ask of God, God will give it him, and then he will give it to you. And then it says in verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. What an assurance. What a comfort. You are not going to be sorrowful like all the other people that don't have any hope. If you know that your brother will rise again, that your sister will rise again, that your mother that died in the Lord will rise again, your wife, your husband who died in the Lord will rise again. Verse 23, what a comforting word. I'm going to read that to you again. Take that to heart. When you take this to heart, all the sorrow is gone. When you take this to heart, you know that there's nothing to worry about. And then I've missed them. They've gone. No, because you're still going to, you stay in the Lord. They are with the Lord now. And if you stay in the Lord, when that day of rapture will happen, what a glorious day it will be. Verse 23 again. And Jesus says unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Look at verse 24. And Martha says unto him, I know that she shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It was common knowledge of every believer that the day was coming, the rapture, the day of rapture, the day of resurrection. And Martha said, Yes, I know that he will he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That puts it beyond any shadow of doubt that that resurrection is going to take place. We're looking at second, uh, we're looking at uh, Philippians rather, Philippians chapter 3 and I'm reading there from verse 20 and verse 21. 
Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 20, looking at verse 21. For our conversation is in heaven. Actually, that word conversation there, it doesn't mean the way we talk, our lifestyle. This one is going beyond that. In the original, it means our citizenship is in heaven. That means we're a citizen of heaven. You know the meaning of that? What it means simply is this. Let's say you're a citizen of this country where you are now. And then you travel out. And you know that your citizenship is in this particular country. Although you travel out, you are coming back to that place again because this is your citizenship. It's saying that our citizenship, our conversation, is in heaven. Which means that we came to this world, but it's not a permanent abode. It is not a permanent country. It is not a permanent place we are going to stay forever. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are here as strangers and pilgrims. We are going back to our country. One of these days, the trumpet will sound. And the Lord will say, children, that's all right. You've done enough here on earth. Now come to your real city, the better city and the better country. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, who shall change our earthly body, body who shall change a weak body who shall change a sickly body the body that is prone to sickness now he'll change it he'll transform it and then it says that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body he's talking about the resurrection body of the lord jesus christ the glorious body of the lord jesus christ that when christ will come he will change a vile body a weak body this body that cannot go up this body that is controlled by the force of gravity when you jump up you always come down because this is a vile body. It's a weak body. It's a body that is controlled by the elements and by the forces of gravity. But then when that time comes, a transformation, a transfiguration, a total change. And then it says, it will be fashioned and made and changed and transformed onto his, like his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It will happen. And thank God that when that day of rapture when it takes place if you have not uh, gone before that time then the rapture will catch you up and then you'll be with the lord will forever be with the lord in jesus name we're coming to point number two now the rapture of purified saints at christ coming i'm coming to first Thessalonians chapter four first thessalonians we're looking at chapter four in chapter four i'm reading now from verse 15 it says in verse 15 for this we say unto you by the word of the lord isn't it wonderful to know that this is being said unto us by the word of the lord you know there are some people that will say when they are preaching they'll say i think that means they're saying, this will say unto you by our thoughts. Other people will say, I feel. That means that they're saying, we're saying this to you by our feeling. Other people will say, I, I just suppose, this is my supposition that maybe this will happen, maybe this will happen. Paul the apostle said, there's no supposition here. Paul the apostle says, there's no human opinion here. Paul the apostle is saying, this is, this is no tradition of man. And this is not something, a denominational dogma. Something he told me that I'm supposed to tell you. He said, no. He said, this was saved by the word of the Lord. This is sure then, because Jesus Christ said any word that proceeds out of his mouth, not a jot and not a titum, shall pass out of that word. It must be fulfilled if this is the word of the Lord. And we know that this is the word of the Lord. We know that it's going to be fulfilled. And praise the Lord, the rapture is definite and the rapture is sure, is certain. It is going to happen. Look at that verse 15 again. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, unto the coming of the Lord. He's coming. He will definitely come. There should be no doubt in your heart, no doubt in your mind, that the word of God says assuredly that this Jesus Christ is coming. And because he is coming, that's why we're getting ready. And that's why we're getting prepared. It says, it is by the word of the Lord, he will definitely come. And then it said, those who are, those of us who are alive will not prevent, will not proceed, will not hinder them which are asleep. Then he says in verse 16, for the Lord himself, not an angel, the Lord himself, not a representative, the Lord himself, not just a heavenly being, the Lord himself, not one of the saints that, you know, left and then came back. You know, sometimes when you're, if your children, for example, if they're in a particular place, and then you want to bring them home, sometimes you'll send a maid, you'll send a servant, sometimes you'll send a driver, 
father sometimes will send a teacher you say go and help me collect them and bring them home the lord is saying he is the one that is going to collect all of us is going to take him us home himself it's not going to send angel gabriel or michael or any other angel it's not going to send any of the saints who have gone to heaven saying i'm too busy in heaven here and those uh, my children those my followers and those my disciples you go maybe peter will go and collect us and bring us there. he said no that the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first and then he says in verse 17 then we which are alive paul the apostle thought it might even happen at some time that's why i said we counting himself as part of the people that make that will be here at the time of the rapture but then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and then he says to meet the lord in the air and so shall we tell me ever be with the Lord. It will happen in Jesus' name. You know, Paul the Apostle received this prophecy of the rapture of God's people by direct revelation from the Lord. That's why I said, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That means then the order of events at Christ's return has been clearly revealed. But the time of the rapture was not known much before this time. They knew about the day of the Lord. You'll find that in the Old Testament that Christ will come the first time and then Christ will come the second time. For example, if you look at the, uh, you look at the prophecy of Isaiah and us, a child is born at Bethlehem, at Bethlehem. And then number two, it says his son is given at Calvary and then it says the government shall be upon his shoulder. He will be born and then he will die to give himself a sacrifice for all our sins and then after that death he will rise again he will come back again and the government shall be upon his shoulder but then the part that is now revealed by the word of the lord is this part of the rapture that we shall not all sleep but we shall rise again i pray you'll be there in jesus name is that all the amen you can give i said you'll be there in jesus name Thank you very much. God bless you. Because, you know, this is what we're preparing for. That the rapture is going to happen. Every one of us must be in a state of readiness for Christ's coming. As we look at the word of God, it says, We shall rise again. That the Lord himself is going to come. Paul was telling the people that the Lord taught us that we should be expectant. And we should live righteously. Waiting for the Lord's return at any moment. And yet be prepared to live and to labor for the Lord while we're waiting for him. We're not idle. You know, some people, they're not doing anything. They're not winning souls. They're not preaching. They're not uh, helping other people to come to know the Lord. I would say, what are you doing? I am waiting. I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. Is that how to wait? We don't wait in idleness. We don't wait in laziness. We don't wait in barrenness, spiritual barrenness. The Lord Jesus said, occupy till I come. You find those two things there, number one, I'm coming, I'm coming, until I come. Very definitely the Lord is coming, but then he says, while you are waiting, while you are preparing, while you are expecting, occupy, be occupied in the work of the Lord until he comes. And you know what the Lord said? He said in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, telling us that this Lord Jesus Christ is really coming and when he comes, what a glorious day that will be. In John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. What makes our hearts trouble when we forget important things? When we forget that the Lord is just is about to come. That this sorrow will not be forever. This suffering will not be forever. And this uh, need or lack in your life will not be forever. That the Lord will soon take it away. And he will take it away in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes when you see some things as if this year is almost looking like last year. And the trauma and the trouble and the difficulties of last year. It looks like I'm seeing something very similar. No, it's just similar is going to vanish away in jesus name that's why the lord said let not your heart be troubled you believe in god believe also in me then he said look at verse 2 now in my father's house how many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will 
come again. Look at the certainty in that verse. Look at the assurance in that verse. And look at the expectation we have in that verse. He didn't say, I may come again. If, maybe if I'm not too busy about it, I may. He said, I will come again. And when he comes again, what's he going to do? And receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. There's no doubt anymore. There's no confusion anymore. Christ is coming. He said he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to take those of us alive. He's going to take us unto himself. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. He's telling us that he's coming. He's searching. And then as some people say, they wouldn't understand. How is it that the Lord will just take the saints so alive? Just take them away. We don't see death at all. Don't you know it happened also before? Look at and the way it happened to Enoch that he didn't see, they didn't taste death look at Genesis chapter 5 the Lord is saying I did it for one person at that time but now I'm going to do it for all the believers all together have you noticed that we're talking about resurrection he did it for one person, for Lazarus but now Jesus is saying I'm going to do it not just for Lazarus I'm going to do it for all the believers the same thing for the rapture, he did it for Enoch but then he's not going to do it for all the believers, he gives us a forties and it gives us here an example a pattern the way it's going to happen let's look at genesis chapter 5 i'm reading there from verse 20 from verse 22 genesis chapter 5 verse 22 and enoch walked with god after he begat me to sell him 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him for God took him he didn't die that is an illustration of the rapture and that is the way it's going to take place for those who are in Christ that he will the trumpet will sound and then he will catch us away the Lord did that too for Elijah I want you to look at um, 2nd Kings chapter 2 2nd Kings chapter 2 I read verse 3 and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today and he said yea or yes I know it hold your peace it means that he also was going to go away in the rapture he wasn't going to die look at verse 5 verse 5 and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today and he answered at ye i know it hold your peace verse 9 in verse 9 and it came to pass when they were gone over that elijah said unto elisha as what i shall do for thee before i be taken away from thee he knew he was to be taken away and elisha knew that elijah was to be taken away without seeing death it happened to elijah it's going to happen to the whole church that is the church living at the time of the rapture if the lord was able to do it for enoch he was able to do it for elijah don't you understand by that same power he's able to do it and he's going to do it for the church righteous people holy people see people and the people abiding in the lord at that time when the rapture will take place let's look at verse 11 it says in verse 11 and it came to pass as this still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and elijah the next two words tell me out loud elijah went up by a whirlwind into where into heaven it's going to happen like that when the lord comes and then the believers are raised from the dead i'm sorry yes also have that they are raised from there and then those who are alive they will be caught up together with the lord what a wonderful day it will be i pray you'll be among us who will experience that in jesus name i want you to look at uh, something in that uh, subtitle number two the rapture of what kind of saints i said what kind of saints Thank you. Purified saints at Christ's coming. Purified saints. Purified saints. You know, it's very important that we understand that, that those who are going to be raptured are purified saints. And uh, who are those people? Look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12. Proverbs. I'm reading from chapter 30. And we're looking at verse 12. It says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, there is a generation that an 
pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There are some church goers, there are some religious people, and they think that, yes, we've heard about the rapture. We too were going because we too were pure, because we're born in our church, we're born in a Christian home, and they have not been washed from their filthiness, filthy language, filthy lifestyle and filthy association, and filthy behavior, all those fil filthy mor morals, all those things are there. And the Lord is saying, those are not the people that are going to go in the rapture. Those are just church-going people. Those are just religious people. Those are just dirty people that have not been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Look at Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. I hope you know where Micah is. It's one of the minor prophets. Micah chapter 6, very near the end of the Old Testament. Micah, I'm reading there from chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 11 and verse 12. Shall I count them pure? or the wicked balances, and with the bag of deceitful weights. There are some people that maybe they are, maybe they are traders, they are merchants, they are sellers, or whatever they are, and whenever they are selling, they'll be telling lies, and then they have all these deceptive weights, and they say, I'm born again, I'm sanctified, I'm holy. And they do not connect what they're doing in their places of work. They cheat, they are fraudulent, and they do not connect all that with being that they need to get ready for the coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord can happen at any time and the lord is saying if you say you are pure with all that deception all that line if you say you are pure with all that fraud and stealing money from where you are working it says shall i count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights look at verse 12 for the rich man thereof are full of violence and the inhabitants thereof have, have spoken lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth how do we get Cleanse, how do we then get purified? Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. How do we get ready for the rapture? For this coming of the Lord. The way we get pure is we confess our impurity before the Lord and we say, Lord, I know it. I know it. I feel defiled. I feel dirty. I feel morally unclean. But I know that the blood of Jesus can wash me whiter than snow. And then when you confess all that, you turn away from that and then you hold on to the grace of God and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, cleanse me. And then he cleanses us and we're purified by the faith we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15 verse 9. I'm putting no difference between us and them. Purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Who are the people that will go to the hill of the Lord? Who are the people that are saying that will go with the Lord when he comes? They that have clean hands, they are born again, they are saved, and then they have pure hearts, they are also sanctified. I pray the Lord will do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. He's a gracious God, he's a loving God, and he's willing, and he's ready to do it for us so that we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, the very words of Jesus Christ, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Lord is coming. The Son of God is coming. And Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, he is coming. And for us to see him, we must be pure in heart. And remember, it's not just by what we do. It's not just by religious activity. It must be that we have been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. That is how it happens. First Peter, I'm reading there from chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 23. It takes this purity of heart. It takes this righteousness from the very depth of your soul before this can really happen. In First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 22. See that she are purified your souls in obeying the truth. Ye are purified, purified, purified your souls in obeying the truth. It takes that purity or the cleansing of the blood of them. It takes that purity that you have gone on your knees in prayer. You have called upon the, uh, upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I know what it takes. You are commanded, be ye holy for I am holy. I want that in what purity, in what holiness, in what righteousness. I want that in me and it is when that is done. Then you will know that you are getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Verse 22 again. See, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto 
unfeigned or pretending on hypocritical love of the brethren. See that she love one another with what kind of heart? With a pure heart, fervently. See or being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth how long? Forever. First John chapter 3. In first John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Beloved, behold, how, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called his sons, the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Look at verse 2, beloved. Now are we the sons of God? Some people say, well, by and by, I'll be a child of God. It's now. You don't know when the rapture will take place. It says, now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, even as he is. Look at verse 3. And every man, how many people? Every man. I said how many people? Look at that verse. Every man, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. That's what it takes. And when the trumpet shall sound, those who are saved, those who are sanctified, those who are holy, those who are godly, those who are righteous, and those who have been cleansed and washed by the blood of the Lamb, it says, in the twinkling of an eye, will be raptured, will go away with the Lord. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And after the dead have been raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It will happen. I said it will happen. And thank God we're going to be partakers of that together in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now: readiness of persevering saints for Christ coming, the readiness, that you will be ready. It's not, it's not enough just to know that Christ is coming. It's not enough just to know that the, the dead will rise and then those of us who are alive, we're going to be caught away together with them and then forever will be with the Lord. There must be preparation. There must be readiness. In fact, the Lord said that over and over again. He said we must be ready. We'll be ready in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 4. For First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then it says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then it says in verse 18, comfort one another. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's a comfort anytime we're going through some situations that looks um, uncomfortable. We're telling the Lord, well, we know it will soon be over because we're to comfort one another with the coming of the Lord. But let me tell you something. If somebody is still a sinner, the coming of the Lord is not going to bring comfort to him. If somebody is a backslider and he remains in that backsliding and he knows that he's doing something evil, that if Christ will come and meet him in this condition forever, he'll be lost. He'll not, that will not bring comfort to him. It's for the saints of God, for the children of God that praise the Lord, I want him to come. Because I know that heaven is a better place. It's a better country. And I'm expecting the coming of the Lord. I know that I'm saved by his grace. I know he has sanctified me and day after day, living a day at a time, victorious over temptation and victorious over all the things, challenges of life and I'm expecting him to come. And then when you talk about the coming of the Lord and the rapture and the resurrection of the dead, it brings comfort. That's why it says for those of us who are real believers, for those of us whose lives have been changed and transformed, it says wherefore comfort one another with these words. And then when your relatives have died, maybe your wife if your husband or maybe one of your children they died in the faith in the Lord or maybe your parents they died in faith in the Lord and then you have been saying I can't see mommy anymore I can't see daddy anymore I can't see my brother anymore and then it says but you know they are born again and you are born again too you are expecting the coming of the Lord it says the comfort is that one of these days you will be taken away with the people of God and then face to face you will see the Lord 
And not only that, you'll see your loved ones that have gone ahead. They are even expecting you over there now. That's what we're talking about. That's why we're talking about number three now. Readiness for persevering saints for Christ's coming. We've read verses 17 and 18 already. Let's look at Matthew. Readiness to be ready. What does it mean to be ready? That means that you are going to, you know, just stay there with the Lord, abide in the Lord in a time of temptation or trial or whatever may be happening. You say, I'm going to hold on till the very end. You see people backsliding right, left, and center around you. you say, no, I'm not going to backslide. I'm going to endure till the very end, persevering. That's what it means, persevering sins. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Those false prophets that deceive many, will they go in the rapture? Give me a good answer. No, they will not. Because it says the deceived men, the deceivers, the liars, the perpetrators, and the people that propagate false doctrine. Of course, they will not go in the rapture. It says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. From what the Lord is saying here, the people that their love will wax cold, will they go in the rapture? Of course, no. But then look at this, but he that shall endure unto the end. The people that remain in the Lord, abide, they abide in the Lord. They're still fervent in the Lord and they know that they are saved. They know they're children of God and they're on the Lord's side every time. Satan comes to temple and says, no, I'm on the Lord's side. And the devil is trying to show that I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. If you'll bow down to me and worship idol, he says, no, I'm not going to worship idol. I'm going to stay with the Lord till the very end. Those are the people. And he says over here, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And then he tells us in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. While we are waiting for the coming of the Lord and we are waiting for the rapture, what are we doing? We are preaching the gospel because it says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, anywhere we are in the world, we are telling other people come to the Lord, we are telling other people there is no other name whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus and we are persevering to persevere means to endure to endure to the very end we persevere, number one we persevere in prayer we are praying and we are saying oh Lord keep me oh lord hold my hand oh lord don't let me fall we're also praying for other believers who are saying oh lord keep my brother keep my sister we're concerned about other people too you're praying for your local pastor you're praying for your local your overseer in your state in your region that as they're ministering to us and they're helping us we're going to endure together until the very end you're praying for all the workers full-time and part-time all of us together that we're laboring together you're praying that we will see the lord on the final day Let's look at this perseverance. We're talking about persevering saints. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You are praying and you are persevering for all saints. That means from the greatest of the saints to the least of the saints. From the people above you and the people behind you and from the people all around you. You are Pray for everyone with perseverance. Look at verse 19. And for me, that is for Paul the apostle, and for the preacher, and for the pastor, it says that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. It's saying that we need to continue in prayer for the preachers, for the evangelists, for the pastors, for the teachers of the word of God. In fact, we need to pray for even prospective preachers. They're not preachers yet. But the Lord is calling them because the Lord himself said, we need more preachers, we need more evangelists, we need more teachers of the word. And we are praying perseveringly, oh God, send more evangelists. Oh God, send more preachers. Because we need to reach everybody in the world before the time comes, before the time of the rapture will take place. And the time is very short. In Matthew chapter 9, 
Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's the prayer we are praying, that the Lord will send more laborers, and we persevere in that. And you are, saying, you are not thinking, oh, we have enough workers, we have too many workers already. We even need to kind of weed them off and screen them. No, we don't have enough and the lord is saying we don't have enough preachers enough pastors we're planting more churches we're reaching out to more people we're telling them they need to come to the lord and as these people are coming to the lord we need to plant and saturate the whole community with churches and because of, we need more pastors and more leaders and more teachers and more house worship leaders and more women coordinators more, more of everything that we have and it says we need to keep on praying for that perseveringly we persevere and then not only that we persevere in prayer, we persevere in persecution. Look at uh, in Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Persecution may arise. You are there in the village. You are there in the city. You are there in the community. You are there in your place of work, and you are there even around you there. And then there are some people because now you have more fervency, and then you have more zeal and more fire, and then you are now up and doing the work of the Lord. We are planting the church there. We are doing evangelism there. We are reaching out there, and some people feel uncomfortable because of that and then they may want to persecute you or maybe you are taking your stand in your place of work I can't do that, I can't, I can't uh, cooperate with you in that because that is evil, I can't cooperate with you in the fraud, you want to uh, perpetrate and then they say you are hindering them from getting all the extra money they want to get and they persecute you because of that, remember the Lord is coming and you are not going to allow that persecution to hinder you or to stop you uh, let's look at Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10 Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 10 But thou also hast fully known my doctrine my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Look at verse 11, persecution. Paul the apostle said, Timothy, you know my persecution, you know my affliction, which came to me at Antioch and at Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Let me read that again. Out of them all the Lord delivered me. I'm going to direct it to you now. All your persecution all your affliction, all your trial out of them all the Lord has delivered you now look at verse 12 it says yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution all that will live in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived verse 14 but continue that's passive. You're a persevering saint. You're continuing. You're not saying persecution is too much. The trouble is so much. Uh, since I came to the Lord and since I began the evangelism and since we got involved in this church planting here, saturating the whole community and the whole old district and the whole region and the whole local government and the whole state, saturating with churches. Every weekend we're going out. In the evenings we're going out. We're having crusade there. We're having something there. It looks like uh, my people don't understand and they're persecuting me. They're for maybe I'm going to stop. No, you cannot stop. You cannot stop. If you stop, how will those souls get saved? If you stop, how will you join hands with the Lord Jesus Christ in building the church? Because it says, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And you are part of the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. It says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou art has learned them is telling us that we persevere we continue you are going to persevere you are going to continue in jesus name if you need to endure affliction and endure all the trials endure and i believe that on the final day you will not miss your reward in jesus name we're looking at the acts of the apostles chapter 26 acts of the apostles chapter 26 other people went through persecution too other people went through all those trials too they didn't give up why should you give up the same 
same God who helped them will help you. And the same God who sustained them will sustain you. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. And I'm reading there from verse 16. In verse 16 it says, But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. The Lord told Paul the Apostle, he said, I've appeared unto you for this particular purpose, to make you a minister and to make you a preacher and to make you a soul winner and to make you a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's why you are witnessing. That's why you are going to people. That's why you are reaching out to them. That's why you are preaching to them. That's why you are saying, come to the Lord. You must be saved. You must be born again. Jesus Christ can wash away your sin. Jesus Christ can transform your life. You can be a new creature in Christ so that they can receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified sanctified by faith that is in me. And then he said, O up, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He said, I persevere. He said, I'm still doing it. He said, difficulties arose, but I'm still doing it. Persecution arose, I'm still doing it. Even beating came as a result of it, but I'm still doing it. He said in verse 20, but showed forced unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Look at what follows in verse 21. For these causes, because of the preaching, for these causes, because of my pers persistence, because of my perseverance, and because I'm telling people, come out of sin and come to the Lord. Because of this, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Verse 22. Having therefore all obtained help of God, I continue. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue. He said, I didn't allow that to stop me. He's saying, don't allow that to stop you. They are kind of slander. They are lying against you or they are beating you or they are insulting you or they are doing whatever it is against you. He says, don't allow that to stop you. He said, I continue. Well, we'll continue and you will continue in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 and we're reading verse 22 there the word is whatever the trial whatever the trouble, whatever the temptation whatever the beating, whatever the persecution, the word is continue, you will continue you will not stop your journey halfway in Jesus name look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Persevering sins. Persevering sins to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. We will enter in Jesus name. Christ coming is much nearer than at the time of Paul. Thoughts of his coming should comfort us and encourage us to watchfulness and to rapturable lifestyle and rewardable service to the Lord. There are many instructions and indication to show that the rapture will soon take place. The rapture is soon to take place and the Lord is saying, the Lord is saying that when he comes, that we will have reward. You will not miss your reward in Jesus' name. Let's look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, the Lord is coming. Revelation 22, verse 12. It says, Behold, I come quickly. The Lord is coming. I said the Lord is coming, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they. I pray that you'll share in this blessedness in Jesus' name. Blessed are they that do his commandments. What's his commandment? Occupy till I come. What's his commandment? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's his commandment? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded them. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. What's his commandment? His commandment is that repentance, submission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. What's his commandment? 
occupy till I come. Are you occupied? Are you obeying that commandment? Are you doing what the Lord said we should do? And the Lord is about to come. How many souls have you want to the Lord? How many churches have you planted? How many disciples have you, have you trained? How many people have you raised up and encouraged and moved on? And the Lord is saying, my reward is with me. And for us who are waiting for the coming of the Lord is when these things are done. We're living the life. We're encouraging other people, influencing other people to live the life as well. And then we're persevering in the way of the Lord. And and when the Lord shall come, you will be there in Jesus' name. And the goodness of the Lord will be upon your life even now and then when he comes. Look at that verse 14. Blessed are they, blessed will you be. That do his commandment that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates or into the city. Let's look at verse 17. It says, and the spirit and the bright say, come. And let him that hear us say, come. And let him that is as us come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Then verse 20, he would testify these things, says, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that grace will support you till the very end. You will persevere. You will be ready. Then you will tell other people, did you? They need to be ready. You will be there in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now. We're talking to the Lord in prayer. With your heart, with your soul, with your mind. Everything within you. You are saying, oh Lord, I know. I'm sure the rapture is going to happen any moment from now. I do not want to appear before the Lord empty-handed. Abiding saints are going to go with the Lord. Precious saints are going to rise from the dead. And people purified saints, they're going to be raised up and then they're going to be with the Lord and then persevering saints. Those who continue, those who continue till the very end, tell the Lord, tell the Lord and say Lord help me. I want to encourage you if you are not born again yet, it's very simple to be born again. If you may come into the church or maybe you are even born in the church or you've been here for a long time and yet you have not definitely any time given your life to the Lord. You've attended retreat, you've attended Sunday worship, you've attended Bible study. This is not your first Bible study you are coming to but you have never, you've never handed over your life to the Lord. You have never said, oh Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I know I cannot save myself. I know Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary and then at a moment of time, you can point to the day and to the time when you definitely said, Lord, I believe you that you suffered for me. You took the penalty of my sin. Save me now. If you've never done that before, do that now. It's very simple, very simple. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Just say that. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. Lord, I depend upon you. Say that. Lord, I depend upon you. And I know that your sacrifice, I know that your sacrifice is sufficient for me. Lord, take my sins away. You have said, Lord, say that. You have said, you will not in any case reject anyone that comes to you. I come to you now. Forgive me, Lord. Receive me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Give me the joy of salvation. Let your grace walk in my heart right now. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. I am saved. Lord, I believe you will not reject me. Lord, I believe you will make the change, necessary change in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm born again. And then for the rest of us, you have given your life to the Lord Jesus before the Lord is saying he's coming again. And he's going to look at the work you have done for him. He's saying, occupy till I come. Tell your neighbor. Tell your schoolmates. Tell your classmates. Tell your co-workers. Tell your landlord. Tell the co-tenants, tell your community people, tell everybody. And a sort of force who are now planting churches and we're going out and we're doing evangelism, come on and join us. Don't just stay at home and say, well, I'm not, I don't have chance. Why don't you have chance? This is something God will reward in all eternity, whatever you're doing now. In place of this evangelism and church planting, is that going to be rewarded in eternity? Come out and say, Lord, I'll be a part of your people. We're going to do this together and the Lord is going to make use of your service to bring many souls into the kingdom. This year is a year of service, a year of soul winning, a year of sacrifice. And you're telling the Lord, oh Lord, I'll be part of your people, abiding saints, precious saints, purified saints, and persevering saints. And when the Lord comes, he will reward us 
in Jesus name the Lord is saying that you have a part to play occupy till I come yes Lord I will with your grace with your strength with your power and with your Holy Spirit anointing and comfort and direction I'll do everything you want me to do and then this work of the Lord will prosper in our hands together